Okay. Oh, wow, it's loud. <clears throat> okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much all for coming. Um, I'm sorry it's a bit chilly. I think we're going to uh, be able to make it a little bit warmer in here over the course of the evening. Uh, if not, uh, feel free to put your coats back on. Um, so, welcome uh, to our annual project talk. This is uh, our one event a year when we don't ask you for money. So please enjoy it. Um, uh, the theme of the evening is our work with children and young people at risk in some of the remotest and most neglected regions of Colombia. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the reasons our focus is increasingly on uh, these areas and explain then how we're helping to protect children's rights in those places. On your seats, you'll see that there's a, uh, a table of all our project partners. We'll give you a, a very brief uh, overview of all the different projects we're working with uh, this year. But at the end of the evening, there's going to be, as usual, uh, an opportunity for you to ask us questions uh, about anything to do with our work or anything else, I guess, preferably to do with our work. Um, and you can ask us more questions about the partners uh, that we work with. Um, so I'm extremely excited to say that we're going to have... We've got two films to show you uh, this evening. The point of this evening is not really that we talk to you, although we will obviously do a bit of that, is that you get to hear as directly as possible from the children and young people that we work with. So we've got two films to show you. Um, the first is two interviews made by children at one of our partner projects, uh, Casa Amazonia, uh, in the far south of Colombia, in Putumayo, uh, a region which you probably know has been long in the grip, had been long in the grip of the FARC guerrillas. Um, after that, we're going to show you um, another film, which uh, is made, again, by uh, children and young people, another one of our partner projects, uh, Fundes Coves in Buenaventura, uh, the port on the Pacific coast of which you will have heard much, and we'll be talking about a bit more later on. When I've shown you the first film, I'm going to pick out some of the themes which I think are particularly important and help to illustrate uh, some of the issues that make it urgent that we should be working in places like Putumayo, Buenaventura, Quibdó, some of the more uh, remote and neglected parts of Colombia. Um, before we do that, before we get into what we're doing at the moment and what we're going to be doing in the future, I wanted just to give you a very brief overview of what we've achieved with your support. What has been our impact uh, over the last 12 and indeed 24 months? And uh, actually, this slide relates to 2016. The reason it relates to 2016 is because we have uh, a lot of data coming in from our eight partners. Uh, it takes time to collate it. So, in fact, these figures relate to 2016, but you haven't seen them before, so I hope you won't feel that I'm trying to uh, pull the wall over your eyes by telling you about uh, something that we did uh, some time ago. Uh, we will have figures for 2017, we just don't have them now. But what I wanted to show you very briefly is what we've done in terms of numbers. In one year, we protected the rights of 16,000 children to freedom from violence, abuse, and neglect. We protected the right of 12,000 children to recovery from traumas that they've experienced. We worked with 11,500 children to protect their freedom of expression, which, as you hear tonight, is something that we think is extremely important. Uh, and we worked with 6,000 children to protect, to protect them from sexual exploitation. A couple of other very important uh, figures here. We work with thousands of children. We reach uh, around 50,000 children a year, directly and indirectly. We can't actually um, monitor exactly what happens with every single one of those. But out of the children that we can be sure about the outcomes of, the, of uh, their work with us, nine out of ten of those children, we are sure, have learned how to protect themselves from violence and abuse. In other words... Our work, the work that you support uh, through us, is extremely effective in protecting children's rights. Equally, 
nine out of ten adults that we've worked with have learnt, we are sure, through our monitoring uh, uh, processes, have learnt to make a more protective environment for children and have taken actions to keep them safe in the long run. One last thing I wanted to underline was the, the wide impact of our work. So it's not just that we work with eight partners in different parts of Colombia. They themselves have worked with 192 other organizations to influence the policy and practice of their work to support and protect the rights of children. So that our work not only reaches a lot of children, but it has a much broader, broader impact through the organizations that our partners have an influence on. So that's very briefly an idea of the impact that our work is having. You can ask, of course, any questions you like about this year, uh, and I'll be very, we'll be very happy to talk to you uh, about that. So, tonight, we're going to talk about two things, as I said. Why we're increase, increasingly moving into neglected, remote regions of Colombia, and what we've been doing there. Now, I just very quickly wanted to show... Um, I forgot that I'm not going to have a pointer, so unless I can get a, 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 like a stepladder or something, I'm, I'm not going to be able to show you what I'm talking about. <coughs> Historically, we've worked mostly uh, around the urban centres of Cali and Bogota, with some, some exceptions. What we're beginning to do is to move into remoter, more what we uh, judge as more neglected areas of Colombia, because that's where uh, the children and young people whose rights are most at risk where many of them are. Now, as you can see on the, uh, on the western edge of Colombia, most of you will be familiar with Colombia, but those two red uh, departments, the, the uh, Choco and Valle, the Cauca, um, they're, they're two places where we are now working increasingly, as is the one on the bottom, which is Puerto Mayo, which we're about to, we're about to see a film about. Um, incidentally, uh, these, these red areas are, uh, show homicide rates. Now, I don't want to dwell on violence in that, in that sense, but in a, in a way, it's, an, it's a one small indicator of the importance of making sure we're working in places where young children, children and young people are facing uh, most uh, threat of violence. Um, but as I, said, I don't want to dwell on homicide figures because that doesn't in any way tell uh, much of a story about Colombia. Um, I pressed the wrong button. Here we go. So, uh, <clears throat> this now is the time, before, I, before we get any further, uh, that I'm going to uh, just quickly talk a little bit more about this theme of uh, our work in remotest regions and the most neglected regions of Colombia. Why are we there and what are we doing? This is a crucial time for Colombia. We, I feel like I've been saying this two or three, for two or three years uh, and I think it still is. I don't know if you agree with me. Um, after the peace accords, uh, the hope of many was the agreement with the FARC would lead to with the withdrawal of, of violent actors from vulnerable communities, uh, particularly those who had been effectively cut off by the conflict from the rest of Colombia. Now, this in turn, many hoped, would lead to an opening up of public space, uh, space for civic engagement, for debate, uh, for, to the resurgence of local democracy and the extension into these communities of security and public services from the Colombian state. All of this, it was hoped, would lead to a flourishing of communities whose lives had been, to some extent, stunted and whose aspirations had been crushed by years of conflict. The, the beneficiaries of this uh, as much as anybody, we, we uh, hoped and still hope and feel could and can be children and young people. And this remains the hope. And to some extent, this is happening. It would be wrong to paint too bleak a picture. But, of course, uh, the path to rebuilding communities after so many years of conflict is never going to be a smooth one and was never going to be a smooth one. Um, so in many communities, the formal withdrawal of the, of the FARC guerrillas has led to the incursion of other armed groups. And also the end of the, the conflict with the FARC has actually brought into sharper focus the persistence of other underlying problems, problems like the continued and malign influence of the international drug trade, 
um, or the marginalization that disproportionately affects certain communities, Afro-descendant communities and indigenous communities, for example. So these factors pose real uh, urgent threats to the safety of thousands of children and young people in these remote communities, neglected communities which are, in a sense, on the front line, as it were, of the peace-building process. It's, that's the reason that we're, to some extent, changing our geographical focus and going into and starting to work in more remote and neglected areas, such as Putumayo, as I was saying, in the south, and, and Kibdo and Choco uh, in, in the north uh, west of Colombia. So, the film you're about to see is made, was made by children uh, in Putumayo, our partner called uh, uh, Casa Amazonia. Um, I hope it's going to give you an insight into the lives of two of the children in this community. It's a remote, remote rural community, as I said, who've been under the influence of the FARC guerrillas for many years. It's a community which has been neglected and discriminated against, uh, and is now struggling with the presence of other armed actors uh, and, of course, the ubiquitous drugs trade. I could go on about what's the background to this community and what the sorts of problems that they face, but the idea, as I said of this evening, is that you get to hear directly from the words and see the faces, which I think is particularly important in this film, of the, of the young people we're working with. So, uh, I think we can play the film, I think. <laughs> Diego, ¿cómo es? Cuéntanos a ver, ¿cómo es el barrio o vereda donde tú vives? Pues mi barrio es, es, mi barrio es, es muy grande y creo que te, tiene algo chévere que es la Casa de la Cultura, aunque no ve mucho, pero sí. Y pues es, es desolado, <ríe> mi barrio es desolado. <ríe> ¿Qué te gusta hacer cuando no estás en el colegio? Cuando no estoy en el colegio, pues... Pues si tengo talleres o tareas las hago y después me pongo a ver anime. Me gusta mucho el anime. ¿Nos puedes hablar de qué se trata el anime? El anime pues son eh, como caricaturas, se podría decir, muñecos. Anime, eh, japoneses, como Goku, Dragon Ball Z, Death Note, One Piece y cosas así. De chévere, yo no sabía. Eh, dice, describe cómo fuera un día normal para ti. <risa> Ayudar en la casa, claro, si, si hay algo que hacer. Y luego, si no tengo nada más que hacer, pues me pongo a ver televisión, anime, películas, lo que sea. Luego almuerzo y, y la misma rutina, no, no salgo mucho de casa. Bueno, ¿cuál es el, la parte del día que más te gusta? La parte del día que más me gusta, pues, es eh, la mañana. El, la mañana de un nuevo día. ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué? Pues, pues como dije, un nuevo día, ¿no? Es como levantarte, abrir la ventana y, y, y escuchar como los pájaros hacen su canto. Es, es chévere y alentador. ¿Qué es lo que no te gusta de tu barrio? Lo que no me gusta de mi barrio. Lo que no me gusta de mi barrio, pues, sus, sus, sus calles, su asfaltado, no son, no son con pavimentos, sino con rocas, con piedras. Eso. Diego, ¿cómo entraste al proyecto? Al proyecto yo entré pues por el colegio, ¿no? Nos dijeron que vamos a tener un, 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 actividades con, con, con Casa Amazonía. Entonces por eso, por eso estoy aquí. ¿Y qué, cómo te ha parecido? ¿Te gusta estar, hacer parte de él? Sí, sí. Pues aprendemos cosas chéveres, ¿no? Y nos divertimos con los demás. ¿Qué cosas has aprendido? Hemos aprendido cosas como eh, la re resolución de conflictos, aprendernos a comunicar. Eh, creo que valores, hemos aprendido valores. A ver, Diego, cuéntanos en qué momentos te has sentido poderoso. Eh, me he sentido poderoso, pues, pues me he sentido, pues, pues cuando, cuando te, te escuchan, o sea, cuando una persona, cuando tus padres, cuando tus amigos. Eh, tiene como un momento para ti y, y escucha, lo que, escucha lo que tú piensas o lo que les quieras decir. Esos momentos son fuertes y poderosos, como dices. Bueno, 
Chévere, por esos momentos son buenos para nosotros los jóvenes. ¿Cuál es la persona que más feliz te hace sentir? La persona que más me hace sentir feliz, pues no sé, no la conozco, pero yo creo que es el creador de anime. Sí. <risa> ¿Alguna vez has podido cambiar algo en el colegio o en tu hogar? Pues en mi hogar, como dije antes, cuando tu familia te escucha, porque, hay, pues, porque sí, mis padres no tenían tiempo para mí, entonces hubo un momento en el que hice cosas no debidas, que no, no es... No es no, no hay por qué hacerlo, pero lo hice. Entonces, y gracias a eso, mis padres tuvieron como la opción de, de prestar la atención sí o sí. Nelsi Ruárez. ¿Cómo es el barrio de donde tú vives? Pues, eh, mi barrio donde vivo es calmado, pequeño. Buenas tardes, este, y es muy bonito. No hay alborotos ni nada. ¿Quién es conforma tu familia? Mi familia la conforma mi madre, su esposo, mi hijo y mi hermano. ¿Qué te gusta hacer cuando no estás en el colegio? Escuchar música y leer. Súper. Eh, ¿Cómo es un día normal para ti? Un día normal para mí es saber que puedo abrir los ojos, darle gracias, gracias al creador por eso. Ver a mi mamá, a mi hijo y a mi hermana, y a mi hermanos vivos y comer y escuchar música. <risa> eh, ¿Qué parte del día es la que más te gusta y cuál no? En sí me gustan, me gusta todo el día y también me gusta la noche. O sea, me gusta despertar porque sé que puedo mirar otra vez a mis seres queridos vivos nuevamente y me gusta acostarme a dormir porque sé que puedo soñar donde puedo ser libre. Está chévere. Eh, ¿Qué es lo que más te gusta de tu barrio y qué no? Pues hace poco vivo en ese barrio, y, pero me gusta por lo que es calmado, es alejado así del ruido de, de la ciudad y todo eso, pero me gusta porque también hay una cancha, un gimnasio donde uno puede ir a ejercitarse. <risa> ¿Y qué le digo? Y también me gusta pues que o sea, la gente que conozco, pues a la gente de los vecinos son bien, bien amables. Son bien colaboradores y solidarios. ¿Cómo entras al proyecto y qué te gusta? Bueno, pues entré al proyecto por, porque ellos llegaron aquí. Y me gusta pues porque son bien lúdicos, o sea, son maravillosos. La forma de ellos que tienen de explicar, me encanta mucho eso. Este, me gusta también cuando Sandra viene y nos hace las recochas, cuando vinieron los de yoga y todo eso. Eso es hermoso, divino y me gusta mucho eso. ¿Qué has aprendido y cómo? Lo, aprend lo que he aprendido pues es un poco a expresarme mejor, a tener en claro bien mi proyecto de vida y, y cómo lo he aprendido de la mejor manera, jugando, eh, escuchando las opiniones de los demás, eh, escuchan mi opinión, o sea, me siento escuchada, me siento protegida, me siento bien. ¿Sí? Muy bien. Describe un momento en que te has sentido poderosa. Pues un momento en que me he sentido poderosa fue cuando... Yo miré a mi bebé por primera vez en una ecografía y, y, y dije, wow, yo tengo una vida dentro de mí. O sea, me siento la mujer más poderosa del mundo. Yo sé que estoy cultivando algo, está alimentándose de mí. O sea, fue la primera vez, o sea, me sentía en una alegría que, que no cabía a sí misma. No, pues cuando nació, Dios mío, yo la que yo explotaba y, y que era de madre. ¿Cómo sería de o sea, persona? Dios mío, o sea, sería como, como que si saliera una luz sobre mí y esa luz pues es mi hijo y la felicidad sí. de que yo tuve una vida en mí, pues eso es maravilloso. Muy chévere. Una persona que te hace sentir feliz y por qué. Tengo dos personas que me hacen sentir felices, o sea, me hacen sentir la mujer maravilla y es mi madre. Y ¿Por qué? Pues, pues porque ellos, cuando yo estoy de por ahí así deprimida, muchas veces que, que, no quiero, que no quiero hablar con nadie, pues mi hijo con esas manitas que tiene me abraza, 
y me dice, ¿qué tienes mamá? ¿Qué te pasa? Me dice, incluso a veces me dice hasta mi sobrenombre, yo digo, mi amor, nada, no tengo nada, simplemente estoy así, no sé, y ellos me alegran el ánimo y dicen, no, mi hija, te tienes que seguir adelante, no le hagas caso a lo que te dice la gente, todo eso es mentira, tú sabes que tu hijo y yo te amamos, entonces pues o sea, ahí ellas son las dos personas que me hacen sentir la mujer más feliz del mundo. ¿Alguna vez has podido cambiar algo en tu familia, colegio? Pues en mi familia, pues no sé que haya cambiado, ¿no? Pero desde que yo empecé a entrar a este programa, a este proyecto, algo lo siento muy diferente. Este, no sé, como que mis pensamientos han cambiado repentinamente y en mí ha cambiado mi forma de, de proyectarme y la forma de sentirme, como, como antes me sentía, lo que ahora me siento es muy diferente. So, that's the first film. Um, you'll appreciate that it, it was made on a mobile phone. It's not high production values, but they, they made it, and, they, and that's what's great about it, I think, is that, that you can see uh, from their words, but also from their faces, as I said, what's, you know, you learn more about their lives from, from that film. I think it's great. I just wanted to pick out a few things from th things that jumped out at me when I saw that, those, those two interviews that I think are relevant, particularly relevant to understanding why uh, it's important that we work in communities like that. One of the first things that struck me uh, was Diego, when he refers to uh, how desolado his, his uh, neighborhood is, how sort of bleak and, and isolated. You know, this is a, this is a common thread linking uh, many of the communities which we're newly working in, in Putumayo, in Quibdo, in Buenaventura, um, for example. They're isolated... Um, in terms of not belonging properly, you might say, to, the, to Colombia, to the Colombian state, and bleak, perhaps, um, because of the lack of resources and opportunities that, that neglect and isolation has brought. Um, but this sense of geographical isolation and apparent abandonment by the rest of Colombia that, in a way, Diego seems to express um, is often mirrored in our experience, uh, Children Change Colombia. Um, by individual children's sense of being personally isolated without allies uh, or a way to escape the limited possibilities um, of their immediate environment. We're at Children Change Colombia, we're working with children to tackle both this sense of personal and of community isolation. And the two things are very important and go hand in hand. Um, another... Uh, theme, I think, which comes out, is that is, and it looks a bit bleak to say it like this, but the lack of, of hope, in a sense, that um, it maybe comes out a little bit, but the importance of, of dreams. I know it sounds a bit Disney, but I think it is important. Um, it, I think it's, it's revealing that Diego says, you saw that the, the, the person who's most important to him is somebody he's never even met in Japan, the creator of the anime comics. I don't even know if there is one person. But um, uh, for the same reason, I think um, Nelsi Nelsie's insistence that uh, what she most likes is when she's asleep. And, and it's only when she's dreaming that she feels uh, totally free. I think that's extremely poignant. And it occurred to me, it's not, it's not um, you know, obviously unusual for a teenager to, to want to, to have a yearning to escape. But I think this sense of being hemmed in and hamstrung by the reality of your everyday life which in some ways uh, one could get from what those two young people are saying, uh, is, 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 does tell us uh, something about the reality of life in these communities. And um, uh, it's something that our partners are working hard to combat with children and young people. Why are they trying to combat this sense of hopelessness, if it is such a thing? Um, because they believe that if it's not actively dispelled, the sense of hopelessness can make children vulnerable, can make them vulnerable to recruitment into armed groups, which can seem to promise escape and significance in a world which is otherwise telling children of their insignificance. It can also make becoming a raspachin, a, 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 a coca picker, seem like a preferable option 
to going and toiling on in a, in a school which promises little. Um, and by contrast, I think this is important, with an inkling of the, of the possibilities of an alternative life, uh, children are not only more resistant to the risks of exploitation, but they can begin to take part in concrete efforts to transform their communities. And this is what so many of the children and young people that we work with are doing. Another theme uh, that comes out is, quite obviously, is, I think, is the... Is the is the lack of services, basic services. One of the aspects of these sorts of communities that urgently needs transforming is this historical lack of services. Um, often these communities that have been cut off from the rest of Colombia lack proper sanitation, healthcare, social and education services. Of course, it's not our role at Children Change Colombia to provide these services, but we can help empower children uh, and their communities to engage with the authorities to demand these services and make sure that they are provided. Schools are a good example. Often schools in the remoter, more neglected, poorer areas of Colombia um, do promise little for their students. But this, we know, can change. And it can begin with children who have been helped to overcome a sense of isolation and a sense of hopelessness and have gained the self-confidence to demand more. And this is what our partner, Casa Amazonia, has managed to do with children at the project. Young leaders from COCA sent a delegation to their local uh, education authority demanding that they provide the two extra years of secondary education which children in other parts of Colombia get. It worked. They did. Now children in Puerto Mayo are getting these two extra years of, 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 of secondary education because largely of children and young people taking the initiative and, and not settling for, for less. Um, a couple of other themes I wanted to quickly mention. Insecurity and trauma and the value of the safe place. Of course, lack of services is not the only uh, problem that many children have to confront. It's also this ongoing and pervasive insecurity. In the country as a whole, of course, uh, the, the number of newly registered victims of the conflict is going down, and this is a great thing, and we shouldn't minimise this. But nevertheless... Uh, the fear of violence is not an irrational fear. Uh, it's particularly in the regions where, new, where we're newly working. Nelsie, for example, uh, re repeatedly refers to the fact that she's so pleased that her loved ones are, are living. You know, this is possibly an oblique reference to the fact that you know, she has witnessed, she's aware of, of the insecurity and violence which... Uh, affects many people in, in, in her community. Um, she also, I think, touchingly suggests that her life as a young mother has been beset by discrimination and prejudice. Uh, her mum says to her, take no notice of what people say to you. It's all lies. Remember, we love you. Uh, that's, I think, that theme of, of being insecure and having a suffered trauma is something which is very common in, in, the, in the communities where we're now working. As Jen's going to describe later on, our work is therapeutic as well as preventative. Uh, one of the enormously important things that our partners are doing is providing safe spaces for children. Where, uh, where using often dance, music and other art forms, they get to express themselves in ways that were previously unavailable to them and can begin to heal from the traumas they've experienced. Also, they're spaces where children can understand and confront discrimination that they may have suffered, for example, because of their uh, ethnicity or their sexuality or their um, gender. I think I'm going to end it there. Um, and we're going to have a look now at uh, another film which uh, says a lot about what children can do when they gain this confidence to be able to speak up for their, for their own rights and the rights of their community. Um, this is a film, like I said, from uh, our partner, Fundes Codes, in Buenaventura. Uh, I just wanted to quickly say something about this theme of isolation and neglect. In some ways, it would be wrong to say Buenaventura is isolated or remote. It's, it's the most important port in Colombia. Yet the insecurity and poverty in which many of its inhabitants live, I think, 
is emblematic of the state of uh, powerlessness and neglect that predates the peace accords and for many reasons persists. So this is um, the second film I'm going to show you tonight. Eh, vivo en Colombia, en el barrio, en, el, en la ciudad de Buenaventura, en el barrio Fuerzo López. Eh, mi voy a escribir ahora, voy a escribir un poquito sobre lo que es el Fuerzo López. El Fuerzo López es pues, un barrio donde los niños se pueden recrearse libremente, pero lo que pasa es que ahora la, la violencia y la guerra, la guerra nos ha afectado demasiado entonces como nosotros como niños nos sentimos en un lugar muy tentado ¿por qué? porque no nos podemos recargar libremente porque el grupo de armados nos tienen amenazados y esa guerra entre pandillas entonces ahí donde los niños nos sentimos muy acorralados y no nos tenemos tanta recreación eh, a mí lo que me gusta de mi barrio es que el barrio es muy unido cuando hay una persona que tiene algún problema los vecinos van y le preguntan, le ayudan para poder solucionar ese problema Yo llegué a Fundescode desde que tenía 8 años por un programa que se llamaba Telecentro. Eh, después de ahí, al pasar los años, como me fui desarrollando, eh, pasé al grupo que se llama Radio. Después de ahí, con la medida del tiempo, con los profesores, eh, para pasar al grupo de incidencia. Y gracias a ahora, pues estoy en un proceso más arrancado que se llama Incidencia de Comunicación, que es un grupo donde Fundescode apoya a los niños para que puedan desarrollar sus capacidades. Mi vida cotidiana es como un arranque que yo tengo porque yo ahí veo que estoy mejorando, qué me hace falta para poder desarrollarme. También es como una meta que yo quiero cumplir para desarrollar mis capacidades intelectuales para poder vivir sanamente. Mi tiempo libre me dedico a jugar los, los deportes que más me gusta que es el ajedrez, el fútbol y el baloncesto. Lo que más me orgullece de mí es que soy una buena persona porque a la hora que un compañero necesita un favor es un problema, lo, le colaboro en lo que sea o cualquier cosa, yo siempre estoy ahí pendiente de mis compañeros y me gusta siempre de ser amigable. En el barrio de Fuerza López Pumareo no tenemos una cancha en donde recrearnos, tenemos una junta de acción comunal donde acudimos a todas nuestras inquietudes, pero no nos solucionan nada, también tenemos partes donde nos violentan los derechos o donde se aposentan las la fuerzas de la guerrilla. Ahora les voy a llegar a presentar a los grupos del Comité de Incidencia para ver qué ellos están haciendo en este momento. están haciendo una cartelera para mostrar una 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 socio una socio una socio carta para dar a conocer cuál es la cuál es la problemática de los barrios de la de lo que está pasando en Buenaventura y su comunidad también pero también dar a conocer cuáles son los artículos que los niños tenemos para que nos cumplan los derechos y cuál es el avance de los niños en su desarrollo social No, Pipe, ya. Yo vivo en, el, en Buenaventura, mi barrio se llama Asesor López Fumarejo. Bueno, mi colegio se llama Institución Educativa Mayara Milagrosa, queda en el barrio La Ramiro. Lo que más me gusta de mi barrio es la recreación, porque ellos se recrean, juegan... Bueno, los tipos de recreación son una que juegan fútbol, juegan abricierre, ponchao, llevita, en fin. 
bueno, lo que menos me gusta es me darle la balacera. Porque un, nunca uno sabe en un enfrentamiento pueden haber heridos. Yo llegué a la fundación por parte de la profesora Pola. Empecé, en el proceso en que empecé fue con radio. Y ahora pues estoy en ARP, que es Acción Reacción de la Protección de los Derechos. Bueno, en la fundación aprendió sobre los derechos, a cómo respetar, respeto hacia los demás y a cómo comportarme. Me han enseñado por parte del diálogo y la comunicación entre dos personas. Mi orgullo, que me sentí orgullosa, fue aquí en la, en la, más que todo aquí en la fundación, porque aquí, o sea, me, trato, me he tratado con personas que ni siquiera he llegado a ese punto y me sentí orgullosa cuando hemos salido y nos hemos comportado así. En mi familia hemos cambiado la manera de, de, de tratarlo. Porque esto pasa en mi barrio, porque hay tanta maldad en nuestro barrio, porque hay tanta violencia. Ay Dios, ¿qué vamos a hacer? Ay, mataron a mi hijo y mataron a mi hermano y mataron a mi esposo. Ay Dios, ¿qué vamos a hacer? Porque hay tanta maldad. Mi pueblo calla, mi gente calla. Con un nudo en la garganta sin poder pasar la raya. Es increíble, esta frontera es invisible. Un dolor indescriptible, lo que a diario mi pueblo vive. Muchas madres han llorado y sus hijos enterrados. Hay muchos desplazados, niños abandonados. El abandono del Estado y del pobre se han olvidado. Ya no puedo soportar tanta violencia en nuestra ciudad. Dios mío, dame una señal para que esta guerra podamos acabar. ¿Qué voy a hacer? Dame una luz que no he podido ver Porque en medio del dolor y de esta oscuridad Danos la paz para volver a empezar yeah. Porque esto pasa en mi barrio Porque hay tanta maldad En nuestro barrio Porque hay tanta violencia Ay Dios, ¿qué vamos a hacer? Ay, mataron a mi hijo Y escasez de empleo es un triste reflejo de lo que ayer yo veo. Servicio público caro y malo, con propuesta cada cuatro años y guerra entre hermanos. Basta, Fabri, va a tu escarabón, Mi pueblo no se rinde, no, no, de reclamar nuestros derechos. Somos parte de una nación, buena aventura, no es tan solo un puerto. Mi pueblo no se rinde, no, de reclamar nuestros derechos, no, no. Somos parte de una nación, buena aventura, no es tan solo un puerto. Bueno, esta fue toda la información que les quise darle por hoy. Me gustó mucho mostrarles cuáles son las actitudes de mi barrio y nos volveremos a ver en otro momento. Hi everyone, um, so I'm Jennifer, I'm the programs manager at Children Change Columbia. Um, I hope you all enjoyed watching the film from Fundus Colis. Um, I'm going to take a look again at the themes that Duncan has already started to explore, um, but take the opportunity to phrase them in terms of what some of our partners have actually been doing over the last year. Um, so healing from trauma uh, is a key element of what many of our partners uh, do. And the song that you saw in this film is one of the ways that Fundes Cordes has helped children and young people to heal from the trauma they've experienced as a result of the violences that surround them. With Fundes Cordes' support, the children drew and wrote stories, and they created characters 
um, that have faced the types of violent situations that they faced and explored how those characters dealt with that violence. This was a safe way for the children to be able to express difficult emotions like rage, anger or sadness. The team helped them to work through these feelings and recognise that they have a right to a life without violence. It was through this process that the young people came to write the song that you just saw in the film. And they also arranged how it would be performed and they participated in the editing of the film. You can hear their pain in the lyrics. Oh God, what are we going to do? I can't bear this much violence in my city. They killed my child, they killed my brother, and they killed my husband. By expressing this pain and reflecting on what's happening in their community, they can start to heal and think about practical things that they can do, ways that they can transform the situation. As they also say in the song, my people won't give up on claiming their rights. Another example of this comes from our partners Tiempo de Juego and Albergue Infantil. Those of you who were here last year might remember um, we had two members of staff from those partners and we talked a little bit about the Comic Relief Funded project that we started last year, which works with gang-involved girls who are now either in um, residential care or juvenile detention facilities. As part of the project, the girls created a performance to show their families when they came to the centres to visit. And the performance was based on the theme of alchemy, the transformation of lead, something grey and ugly, into gold, something bright and light. During the workshops, as always, Tiempo de Juego used the artistic activities as a way for the girls to learn about life skills. But one girl in particular, 14-year-old Sophia, didn't seem interested. She sat in the corner, she was closed off from the group, and she wasn't willing to participate. One day, when they were finalising the details of the performance, the group realised they needed a narrator. To everyone's surprise, Sophia put her hand up and volunteered. Once she started to participate, she started to share her story. A difficult story of a life that caused her to lose trust in people and led her to drugs and gang involvement. Telling her story, she became an inhibited, funny, happy, as if by sharing the story she was shedding it and was finally able to show who she really was. When the performance had finished, someone asked Sophia how she felt. She said, I'm happy. It feels good when you can transform something ugly into something beautiful. The amount of violence and insecurities in the neighbourhoods in which our partners are working is something that comes out in both of the films, and which Duncan's already mentioned. So a vital part of what all of our partners do is to take action to make those communities safer. Our partner, Circulo de Estudios, who work in Kibdo, in uh, the capital of Choco, which is an area affected by drug trafficking and armed groups, have been working through local community leaders to create strategies that protect children and young people from risks such as recruitment into armed groups like the ELN and the paramilitary successor groups uh, that are active in the area. In 2017, the community leaders ran activities with children and young people to identify places and or particular times that the children feel at risk. And then alongside their families, identify what adults can do to help reduce these risks. With this information, they designed and implemented safe routes for children to go to and from school, identifying particular cases or times when children needed to be accompanied to school or to project activities. This is an example of a practical and, and simple way in which adults and children can work together to create a protective environment for children. After the previous video, Duncan spoke about the power of dreams. How Nelsie said that she was happiest when she was asleep, because when she dreams, she can be free. And how Diego uses anime to escape his desolate surroundings. We saw it in the Fundes Codes video too how the young people there are dreaming about an end to war, violence and poverty. Dreaming can be both a means of escape from reality and also a practical way to begin to think about changing reality. After all, how do you encourage or work towards change if you can't first identify what it is you want to change? But dreaming can also be difficult. If war and violence is all you've ever known and all you seem destined to know, how do you dream about a life without them? 
If all you've ever known and all that you see in those around you are limited life options, uh, for example, joining the gorilla or dropping out of school to pick coca, how do you dream about a future where you have a different life? That's why part of what our partners do is to help children identify their dreams in a real, tangible way, helping them to think about what they want to achieve in their lives outside the violence and insecurity that surrounds them, and then helping them to identify clear actions they need to take to achieve this, and supporting them along the way. Our partner, Karan, who works with former child soldiers, shared a story with us that I think demonstrates this well. Last year, a teenager, we'll call him Ernest, joined the program. Ernest was very withdrawn and uncommunicative, and after some time in the garia, being told what to do and where to go, he found it difficult to think about what he might like to do in his life, other than knowing that he liked to cook. Karan's team supported Ernest to think more about this interest, how he could use it, and the practical steps that he would need to take to develop the interest into a skill. After a few months on the project, he began to show some initiative. He found a cookery course and asked Cran to help him to get a place on it. He took responsibility for making sure he was able to get to all of the classes on time, and he even started to learn more about cookery by himself, while at the same time participating in all of the other project activities that Cran runs with all of the young people to help them to reintegrate into society. Today, Ernest is still on the project, and with Cran's support, he's been able to turn his interest into a dream and take concrete steps towards turning that dream into a reality, a life plan that he had previously never thought possible. As some of you might already be aware, in May last year, there were large-scale protests in both Choco and Buenaventura in response to high levels of violence and insecurity and other issues. You might have noticed some images of those protests in the Fundus Coelis film. Hundreds of thousands of people across the region went on strike for 22 days, demanding basic rights such as access to clean water, education, health care, and freedom from violence. Fundus Coelis was one of the organizations in Buenaventura that organized these peaceful protests. And a central part of what they did was ensure that children and young people had a voice in this. They asked the young people involved in our project what they thought about the strike, what their main needs were, what measures they themselves would propose to improve their lives, and what support they needed from the state and from their communities to make this possible. As part of this process, two of the young people from the project were chosen to talk with representatives of the national government and present their proposals and those of their peers, which included having safe spaces for children to pay, to play, a better quality of schooling, and access to programs that would help them develop their skills like music, dance, drama, sports. One of those leaders, 14-year-old Nicole, who you can see in the middle there, Travelled to Bogota in September last year to be part of the panel of, of young people that Children Change Colombia organised with presidential candidate and negotiator in the peace process, Humberto de la Calle. At this event, Nicole emphasised the importance of youth participation in the construction of peace in Colombia. She said that children want to contribute to the peace process, but that so often they don't have the opportunity. You might remember that in the first video you saw, Diego's friend asks him, when have you felt powerful? And his answer is, when people listen to you. When they listen to what you think, those moments are powerful. As Duncan mentioned, it's so important that children and young people have these sorts of positive opportunities to make their voices heard and feel that someone is listening to their opinions, to their perceptions of risk, and to their ideas on what to do about this. We believe, as do our partners, that giving children and young people the skills and opportunities to make their voices heard and making sure that adults listen to what they have to say is not only a valuable protective factor in itself, but it's also a sustainable way for children to transform their lives, their communities, and ultimately, Colombia itself. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now be opening a question and answer uh, session. So if anyone has any questions, then there'll be a couple of people going around with microphones. Uh, 
Uh, no, we can't make it warmer in here. <laughs> the first question, I'm afraid. Um, hi there. Uh, my name is uh, Leonardo. And uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for the presentation, uh, which I thought was very informative. And um, I think what is clear from, from the presentation and from hearing all the young people that, um, that we saw is that having a space uh, for them to escape the problems that they have in their lives, a, a space to play, to learn, uh, just to be children or be teenagers mm -hmm. is incredibly important. Um, but I imagine uh, having those spaces in a safe manner in remote areas is even more difficult precisely because of the presence of uh, illegal violent groups. Um, so um, in your experience, in the experience of the organizations that you uh, support, uh, do these illegal groups respect these spaces, these organizations that are opening up opportunities for, for the young people? Or is that a challenge as well to try to stop these um, groups from disrupting? I think one of the key, so, so something, one of the photos that you might have noticed in Duncan's presentation was a photo um, that was in Buenaventura and it was a group, a, a whole group of young people and community members in a space that was something that they had reclaimed and they had, um, when, when Fundes Cores does it, they, they hold uh, mingas, so it's a whole day activity where everyone from the community comes and they clear the rubbish away and they paint it and they, they make it a, a nice, safe space for children to be. And the key element is that all of the community is involved in that. And I think it's important to remember that the, the armed groups um, are members of the community as well. You know, they're not, they're not uh, agents from outside the community that come in and, and operate control. Um, there are also people within these communities. And so the act of involving people from the community in that process of having, um, you know, in, in, in some cases with Fundes Cordes, there have been times where young people in the community have been related to the armed groups that, that are operating in the areas and that control those, <coughs> excuse me, that control those areas. Um, so they, those, the armed groups also, in those cases, have an interest in making sure that those, those spaces remain. They, they are involved, either they've personally been involved or their family members are involved. And so I think that's a crucial part of that because there is a risk that just because our partners have come and, and have worked to reclaim these spaces, there's nothing physically stopping the uh, members of the armed groups from coming and taking them back or coming and using them for, for various things. And as you heard, one of the young girls in the video said, you know, this is something that's happening all over the community. There are, there are regular shootouts in the streets in Buenaventura um, these days. Um, so it doesn't mean that, unfortunately, it doesn't mean these, these spaces will be safe forever. But by involving the community as much as possible, they're making it more likely that these spaces will remain safe. Um, and that's, that's as much as we can really do. Mm, absolutely. I, I think there's another, there's another thing that we should be aware of, and, and, and your question is very relevant here, is that um, in some ways, Children Change Colombia and our partners are encouraging, or in, in many ways, they're encouraging children to, to take, to, to put their heads, as it were, above the parapet and to, to occupy these community spaces, to, to, to become more involved in local democracy, to, to, to become involved in their communities. And one of the things which is happening, and, and something we didn't quite touch on in, our, in our, what we were saying, was that um, in, in the, in the post-accord Colombia, uh, many other interests are rushing in to the spaces which have been vacated, as you, as you will know, by, by the FARC. And there's, there's economic interests. There's interests both legitimate and illegitimate. Um, and and in, in a sense, we're encouraging children and young people to, to become one of these interests and to take part in, this, in these contested spaces. And it's, of course, absolutely not without risk. Um, 
Uh, but one of the things that we are very sure about is that we are working with, with the organizations who are most responsible and most rooted in their communities and most able to protect children from the risks that are inherent in beginning to claim uh, their rights as, as children and young people and members of their community. There's just been um, a, 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 an assassination of a, a community activist who was very close to Fundes Cordes in Buenaventura. Um, and he, he was protecting, literally protecting a football pitch in a part of Buenaventura that, that was required by uh, in, economic interest in the port uh, for, for building uh, to, to be part of the, the, the port industry. He was getting in the way saying, this is our community, we've been here for 30 years. We've reclaimed this land, and now it's valuable to other people. Uh, it doesn't mean we're just going to give it up. Um, he is assassinated. And he is, uh, as I say, he, he is defending communities in which these children live. Um, and we're, uh, at Children Change Colombia, um, as it were, right there with these, with these communities. But it's not. There's a very good example of, of the way in which it's not, it's not without risk. Uh, and the post-accord Colombia has new risks which confront uh, these communities. And what's, what's clear is that if we are interested at Children Change Colombia of working with the most vulnerable groups, the groups of children and young people are most at risk, is, is that these are the places where we should be. And that's why we're, we're, we're moving into these, into these communities. Thank you. I, um, thank you. So um, that's actually a, a really key part of the work that Fundes Cores is doing. So the local authorities he was referring us to is something called the Juntas de Acción Comunal, which are like the very smallest level of local authority. Um, so any of the... Um, in, in Buenaventura, we're working in four comunas, like four areas, and uh, depending on the size of the comuna, they can have um, anything from two or three to up to six or seven juntas de acción comunal in each of the comunas. Um, and and the, the, the whole aim of them is to be at that, that smallest possible level to, to be there. Um, the members of the comunas are members of the community. They're meant to be able to listen to the concern of the, concerns of the community and then relay those concerns up the line. And unfortunately, often that doesn't happen. There's a lot of corruption involved. Sometimes the members of the, of the juntas are actually members of the armed groups. Um, and so it's, it's a huge problem. But one of the things that Fundes Cordes is really trying to do is... Um, animate the, the juntas and make sure that they're working. And they're doing that by getting the, again, getting the community members involved. So some of their work, um, some of, of what they're doing in the project involves working with, um, with family members, with community members, and, and getting them to, um, to be involved in what the children are doing and, and to learn as well as the children, learning about what the children's rights are and how to protect them and what their responsibilities as parents or as community members are towards the children. And one of the things that they can do is, is make sure that the Juntas de Acción Comunal are doing their job. And one of the things that the young people can do is, is um, make their voices heard in, uh, against the, the Juntas de Acción Comunal and hold them to account for what their responsibilities are. Um, and so what we're seeing already is that, you know, it's a, it's a difficult process and it's a slow process, but we are seeing that there has started to, um, to be more engagement between those hunters and the project. Um, 
we also have now at least one of the hunters has someone who's a volunteer for the project sitting in the hunter, um, which is sort of a, a step towards making sure that that, that one is, is more responsive to the needs of the community. Um, they're, they're also invited to one of the things that Fundus Corlis does every year is they have um, a forum which is run by the young people, planned and run by the young people, at which they talk about their concerns, they talk about what they think needs doing in their areas, and they lay out what they think the responsibility of those um, of, of these local government agencies, and also up to you know the district secretary of, of culture, the district secretary of education. Um, so all of those government agencies are invited to these forums and have follow-up meetings as well to try and make sure that they're listening to those concerns and to start that work of trying to engage them and get them to take action on this. Hi, thank you for the presentation. It's good to see so much effort about my country. My name is Sebastian. Or Sebastian. Uh, I have three questions, super easy, super, super easy. So the first one is, can I get more information of each project, like a detailed, like a, well, for example, I'm gonna take one. So there is one in Buenaventura, so you just mentioned the, the impact of violence in those groups in Las Juntas de Acción Comunal. And I know that there are so many factors that are involved. So sports, culture, family, schools. So I would like to know like a, how is like a, the role of the children chain Colombia in these projects? Because, well, maybe I, I didn't understand well, but Properly, what is the role of the foundation? It's just to coordinate your the partners, the, the partners that you have there, the more than 90 partners in Colombia, or is just go there, get involved, work with the community, and so on. The second question, well, the first one is to get more information. The second one is the role of the foundation. And the third one is related with the first slide that you show about the measures. So. That, num that numbers, well, um, I work in, with maths and this kind of stuff, so that's why. Uh, how do you measure the social impact of your efforts that there are so many aspects involved that you said, like, uh, you can reach 16,000 people, 12 uh, children, sorry, 12,000. So I would like to know if, and this is like a why I joined this, because I love the social, and I have been, well, I live in Medellin, Cali, and I work in social foundation there in Colombia. So that's why I love this foundation. I would like to love, so I would like more information. That's it. Thank Brilliant. you. Well, we would definitely like you to love it as well. Um, <laughs> shall I start? And yeah, then go ahead. If I, if I have any gaps, you can compliment. Um, Regarding the different projects, I think rather than going into in, in great detail into all of the projects, I can't remember if Duncan mentioned at the beginning, but everyone should have a, a sheet on their seat that has just the basic information about each of the partners we support and the projects that they're running. Um, for further, inf for more detailed information, we can we can talk about that maybe during the wine reception, um, and I can give you a bit more information. There's also a lot of information on the website about the different um, projects and what exactly they do um, for anyone that doesn't manage to grab hold of one of us in the wine reception. Um, in terms of how we work, so we work through local partner organizations. Um, at the moment, we have eight partners working in the, the different areas of, of Colombia that Duncan mentioned earlier. Um, and we, what we do is we, um, we work on, on neglected issues, which is something that we haven't really touched on so much tonight because we've been focusing on the neglected regions. But, but our way of working is to... Um, to identify the issues that other organizations aren't working on or that we think are so important and have such a significant impact on children's rights that the work that is being done isn't sufficient to address those violations of children's rights or um, you know, for whatever reason there's just not enough of it or it's not, it's not efficient enough. Um, 
So we work on those issues and that's how we start defining how we're going to work. That's how we start choosing what we're going to work on. So at the moment, um, our neglected issues are um, recruitment into armed groups and, and reintegration into society. Um, sexual violence, including um, conflict-related sexual violence. Um, commercial sexual exploitation, which is sort of a, a small part of sexual violence, a very specific element of sexual violence. Um, we're looking at, uh, at the moment, we're in conversations with a new partner that we're hoping we'll be able to get funding for to start this year, which will be working on um, mining and the ways in which mining can violate children's rights. Um, and moving into the future, we're starting to think about uh, education, access to education um, and disability. As, as potential issues that we want to. We think uh, with the limited information that we have at the moment are potentially that there are specific elements of that that are neglected and we're going to be working more to understand um, how exactly those are neglected, where the gaps are, where, where other organisations aren't reaching and what we might be able to do um, to, to have an impact there. So once we've thought about that theme, then we, we start to try and identify a partner. So we work through local partner organisations um, who, as, as Duncan said before, we work with partners who have a solid base within their community, within the community that they're going to work in. So in the case of Fundes Cores in Buenaventura, for example, they, um, they're a community-based organisation. They have a strong base in, in, in Buenaventura. They understand the, the needs of the population. Um, they have very good relationships with the community members. Um, and, and all of that is absolutely crucial for, for us to ensure that the work that they're doing actually addresses real problems. Um, and, uh, and that we can have the sort of the, the ownership and the, the engagement of all of those community members that we touched on before as being so important for the project to be a success. Um, so that's how we work. We don't ourselves as Children Change Columbia go and implement projects, but we find the local partners that already have the skills, that have the expertise, and that have that strong community uh, knowledge and relationships, and can use all of that together to deliver um, effective projects. And finally, in terms of how do we measure social impact, um, is a very complex question, um, but we have... Um, we have in place quite a solid monitoring and evaluation system. All of our partners have, for, for their individual projects, have a log frame that includes um, the overall objectives that they want to achieve, and then uh, within that, individual uh, indicators that measure the specific changes that will help them understand whether they'll be achieving those overall objectives. Um, in terms of bringing that together to create the impact data that Duncan discussed at the beginning, that's a very complex process, as Jade, our um, recently departed uh, research intern, can tell you. Um, it involves what we don't do, which uh, some larger organisations uh, will have their sort of organisational level indicators that they say to partners, we want you to measure X, Y and Z. And then that all feeds through into us and we can see as an organisation what our impact is across the range of projects that we have. We don't do that because we think it's really important that what our partners are working on and what they're measuring is what they want to do. We don't want to impose something on them, especially since the work that our partners do is quite wide-ranging. But there are a lot of similarities between what they do and the different things that they're measuring. So what we do is gather all of the information that they collect from their indicators um, and pull that through into our own organisational level indicators to give us an idea of what has been the impact of Children Change Columbia. Now, as you can imagine, this is a, this, it is a long process, and so this is why we don't yet have the data for 2017. We'll probably have it in maybe June this year. Um, it does take some time to go through. But yeah, that's, that's an overview of, of how we do it. Can I just make one, one small point, mainly because I want to keep talking because I'm freezing. <laughs> um, uh, about your second point, uh, how do we work? One of the important things to emphasize is that we want to make sure that when we end a partnership uh, with a Col Colombian organization, 
they are a stronger and more sustainable uh, organization than, than they were when we began it. Um, I, I, and one of the ways in which we do that is very important, importantly linked to monitoring and evaluation. So one of the things that we, we do, we've been working for 26 years uh, in Colombia, one of the things we do is use that experience, that accumulated experience, to help them understand better what it is, what impact they are making, and, ha and how to communicate that better. Because in the end, uh, that's one of the key things which is going to make, make them able to have a, a, a bigger and more sustainable impact on, on, on children and young people's lives. And so that's, one of the, that's, that's an example of the way in which we also provide, as it were, technical support to our partners. We also help them with you know, organizational issues and financial management issues. So it's not just the question of providing funding. The other thing uh, that's important um, that we provide to our partners is that we are, we, we, we have this network of, of current and ex-partner organizations who, who collectively we provide an enormous uh, well of experience and, and uh, learning about working to defend children's rights in Colombia. I'm quite warm now. Any more questions? Or is that more I think we're, oh, well, got, this will have to be the last the red, question, I'm afraid. We're the being red and red card. Out of time. <laughs> um, so. Any other questions, we can, we can answer them later in the wine reception. Great, I slipped in there. Thank you. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Patrick Melville. Um, I've got a question about the funds, obviously. I mean, how do you sort of ass assess each one in terms of You've got eight. Have you any limits to go above, or do you invest into the existing ones? What's your criteria? And obviously, there's so much work to do out there. And how do you juggle that? I'd like to know mm. about that. Thank you. Yeah. So, in, in terms, just to clarify, we don't we don't always have the same eight partners. Um, they they change. We tend to have partnership agreements of an initial one year with a new partner while we're, you know, both sides are seeing how it works. And then it goes into a partnership agreement of um, two to three years so that we can actually have something reasonably long term. The partner has security that, that, that they'll be um, funding over that time and they can plan a project where we can see the impact over that period. Um, at the end of that, then we, then we reassess, um, we reassess whether the issue that they're working on, whether we consider that it's still neglected, whether um, there's some sort of, um, some, some way that, the, that what they've been doing can be developed and taken to a second stage, you know, scaled up or where, um, have, have a broader impact, can be used as a model um, for other organizations. And, and based on those um, considerations, we may or may not invite a partner to make a, a, another application to us to, to, be, to become a partner again. Um, in terms of how do we decide you know, whether to have more partners or less? It, it basically comes down to funding. Um, at the moment, we have approximately enough funding for eight partners, and so that is um, the number of partners that we have. We have two project officers in Colombia um, who work with four partners each. Because of the very in-depth accompaniment that our project officers offer to our partners, as, as Duncan was just saying, um, we don't really think that it would be feasible for them to work with more than four organizations. Um, they do have really close relationships with our partners. They're in contact, you know, sometimes daily, um, definitely weekly about various questions that the partners have, support that they need, things that we have. Um, with every partnership agreement, we have a partnership objective, which is something that the organizations together decide that the, the partner organization would like to do to, um, to help strengthen them as an organization. And so that's something that the, the, the two, the, the, um, the, the partner and the project officer are constantly working on throughout the term of the, of the project agreement. So with that kind of, um, of workload, with that, with that kind of support, it wouldn't be possible for our partners, we, for our project officers, we think, to give that support to more than four um, partner organizations. Time for one more question. Uh, if a pro short one, yes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'll keep it short. Um, I was just going to ask about some of the 
the, the context, uh, the operational environment, and some of the, the, the changes, I suppose, at national government level that are being made to enhance and protect some of the rights that you're trying to implement at the local level? Uh, and, and what, so specifically... <laughs> Well, um, there is a, there's a, uh, a new agency um, uh, just been set up called the Agency for Territorial Renewal, I think it's called, um, which is specifically uh, there to implement new development plans for precisely uh, those, those um, regions of Colombia which have been neglected and have been particularly... Uh, uh, um, badly, as it were, affected by, by the years of conflict. Now, um, I'm not an expert on actually how these programs are working, uh, but, to, but um, from actually, I'm very pleased to say I, I got to speak to the director of, of that agency. And I, she's an incredible woman who is absolutely dedicated to, to bringing, as we were saying, bringing the, the state to these places which, were, which have been neglected. But not only that, to involving uh, individual communities in deciding how they should, uh, sh should spend, apart from anything else, uh, the resources that hopefully are going to become available. I don't know how that's working, and I, I, I won't pretend to be able to give you the details. What I am sure of is that... Um, the old cliche about Colombia being two countries, one on paper and one in real life, is certainly true. That all the lovely processes on paper that have come out of the peace process and subsequently, which are to do with reactivating, you know, uh, uh, revivifying communities who've been, who've been neglected and who've been at, uh, at the mercy of armed, armed groups, etc. All the lovely stuff on paper... The government is not going to be able to do it on its own. The, the centralised bureaucracy, bureaucracy, however well-intentioned, and we, we don't have to get into that, we don't have to you know, uh, go into a debate about how well-intentioned it is, but this woman I'm talking about is very extremely well-intentioned, is not going to be able to do it on its own. It's precisely the sort of work that, uh, that Fundes Coyes are doing in Buena Ventura, where the communities themselves are organising and making sure that their interests and their voices are heard, and particularly that of the young people. It will only be successful, these lovely uh, ideas on paper in Bogota, they'll only be successful if the communities themselves can be properly involved in them. And that means the children and young people. And that's why uh, Children Change Colombia and our partners' work, I think, is so important at the moment. Uh, this, what, as I've said uh, endlessly, is such a crucial time for Colombia. So good question, sorry, not very good answer. So, that's it uh, for the questions for now. But we're going to go into, into a place with a roaring fire and rugs. And, <laughs> and, and we're going to have a glass of wine. And, and you can ask us all more questions. A couple of things I just want, wanted to mention before you do run off. We've got a couple of other things. Uh, yes, there they are. Do these things. Uh, become a children change pro uh, Columbia promoter. Is that right? Yeah. Um, Colombian food tour. As, as featured in Time Out. If you're Colombian or if you're not Colombian, uh, you want to go on our Colombian food tour, please sign up. Um, our next one is Doretta Wen. Doretta, it where are you? It says on the leaflet. It says on the leaflet. Thank you very much. It's fantastic. Uh, if, if you're Colombian, you, you, it'll make you less homesick. If you're not Colombian, never been, you'll want to go. And then we have our um, Thames Walk, which is June the up there. Ninth. Ninth, you see? I've got the, um, so please come to that. You've got a long time to get sponsorship and it will be warm in June. <laughs> so let's go and get a drink. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>